I got to see the grief that my parents were going through and I just wanted to make them feel better because I loved them so much. Yeah. And so I just decided to stop feeling. That's, it's difficult when you, you know, you could be at a funeral or some other mass or something. And uh, when you see someone else tear up, it has a bigger effect on you then than it does if it didn't happen. You kind of, you lose your emotions because you see somebody else's emotions being lost. So you kind of lose them all together. Hello, I'm Christine O'Donnell. I'm the founder of Bright Sighted Media, and I'm excited to have this opportunity to share a little bit more about myself and my business right here on the Seriously Connected podcast. Something that has been on my mind for a while, if you know my past, I was a TV news reporter for many years, including here at News 10 ABC, which is in the capital region. I had been in the TV news industry for more than a decade before starting my career in podcasting. And I wanted to maybe revisit some of the stories and the lessons I learned from my time working in TV news. If you watch the news, you know the saying, if it bleeds, it leads. But maybe you don't realize that there's somebody behind the scenes walking up to someone's house after hearing about the awful thing that just happened at that home and then knocking on the door and asking for that person to share a little bit about what just happened to them on the very worst day of their life. People often ask me if working in TV news was like the movie Nightcrawler, you know, that like kind of creepy movie with Jake Gyllenhaal where he would listen to scanners and then show up and then film crime scenes before like even the news investigators were able to get there. And I can say from personal experience that in some cases it was like that, that I would be listening to the scanners and then I would show up on the scene of a crime while the crime is sometimes still in progress. There were a lot of times I put myself in dangerous situations. There was a lot of unsafe things that were constantly happening in my time working in TV news, not to mention the emotional toll it took on me to be the person who was talking to a family on the worst day of their life when they lost a family member when they weren't expecting to, or they lost a loved one, or they were involved in an awful accident. The news doesn't show up a lot on good days. The point I want to make is how does someone like me end up working in TV news? And I thought, what is one of the best ways to share a little bit more about myself and how I've gone from that career into this one than to interview my dad? And so my dad, Gregory O'Donnell, a former corrections officer, and I guess now he's a little bit of a real estate guy, is joining me today for this episode of the Seriously Connected podcast. I did my very best to get him to share some nuggets for women in business, but we also do talk about true crime and mental health a lot because we have that in common. So I really do hope you enjoy this episode. It was really a weird but kind of fun experience sitting in these chairs with my dad and talking about our past lives together. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to Seriously Connected. I'm Christine O'Donnell, and we have a special episode planned because the man in the hot seat next to me doesn't want to be in it, <laughs> but he is here today because he's my dad, and he said when he walked in that he was here because he supports me, so thanks. Thanks for that, Dad. That's correct, yep. Otherwise, me and podcasting and talking on the air, not something I'm looking forward to, but... <laughs> but here we are. Um, so you've never been interviewed by a journalist before. Have you ever been on TV? Have you ever been in the newspaper? Uh, How much dirt can we find on you online? <laughs> None. 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 <laughs> this is it. I mean, I mean, I've done interviews like uh, for like brief newscasts or things like that as a younger man. Um, also, you know, as a uh, retired person now during my career, I had to be interviewed by people, but it wasn't this type of a setting. What kind of setting was it? Uh, less formal. <laughs> this feels formal? To me, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. But, uh, it, you know, it's okay. All right. So so what do you think of your daughter's choice of career? If you like it and you're happy, I'm happy for you. I hope you become very successful at it and it works well for you. And uh, that's what's important to me to see all my kids happy. So if this is a career that you want to go forward with and embark on, I'm good. I'm happy for you and support you. 
was it is it weird to know like where I was in TV news to now where, where I am here? Is that surprising? No, no or? I think you're still in the same you know uh, journalistic type of a career. So it's a natural transition, I would say. Right? Yeah. yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I don't know if it was very natural. You actually were there when my like transition started. Remember when I was fired from Fox Twenty Five? <laughs> Do you remember? Yeah. 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 What yeah. was that like for you? What did you see? I was a head scratcher because I thought you were really good at what you did. But, you know, I understand the, you know, ups and downs of everything. You were, I think you were the last one in, the first one out yeah. type of thing. So that makes sense. But, but like my whole scandal. Oh, now we're talking um, in Boston. Yeah, Boston. Okay. I thought you were talking about Fox 11 in yeah, Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. No, that's, yeah, well. Because you saw like me. On my worst days after that. No, I don't want to say I didn't like Boston anyway, but what you had to go through to just to get to work was crazy. You know, I think you were on three different buses or a train in there somewhere too. And if you didn't do that, you had an Uber, which becomes very expensive. So I got a rental car. Yeah, It almost becomes uh, you're working just to pay to get to work and back. Yeah. So it, it, was, a, it was a handful. So you're finding the bright side of that situation? Well, that was like the end of my TV news career. Don't you remember? Yeah. Oh, no. I was I was also going back to when you went back to California. Mm-hmm. You were with that company, Hippo or Rhino or something. Yeah, a golden hippo. Okay. Yeah. So so you were still kind of in the, I don't want to say the, not the news business, but the journalism business anyway. So yeah. you're content. You're, you know, you're doing okay. Mm-hmm. So did I seem like I was doing okay? Because I'm pretty yeah. sure I was asking your wife for medication. <laughs> <laughs> You may have been, but uh, being from afar looking at what was going on, everything seemed okay to me. It's tough sometimes, you know, as a, as a young uh, family trying to make everything work and juggle everything. It's tough. You know, I've had my tough times and you, you power through them. So let's talk about them. <laughs> what are your tough times? Today. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I'll give you a good example. When you grew up, I chose to go on the afternoon shift just so you'd have a parent around you more often. And also the, the cost of daycare becomes ridiculous when you have three children that all require daycare. It's almost not worth working if uh, we didn't have staggered shifts. So your mom worked during the day and I worked at night or in the evening. And um, I watched you guys during the day. And when she came home, you, you had a brief period most days where uh, you had a sitter or who we called uh, Grandma Carol. And everything worked out pretty good, but you were busy all the time. And uh, one thing... I've learned when you've got kids around, don't try to get anything else done. Just focus on those kids. Because if you if you think they're going to let you get away with not keeping an eye on them, they'll get out that door and be down the street or up the street. Or Are you talking about your kids or oh, my kids? My kids. Any kids. Okay. Any kids as a rule. They're just all mischievous and energetic. I'll give you a good example. You could be in the store and one kid will run one way, one kid will run the other way. Which one do you follow? Which one do you stop? <laughs> I, I stop the one that's less likely to get abducted or the more likely to get abducted yeah, is yeah. the one I chase after. Yeah. Like, oh, like people be snatching Ava. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you, you just, those are decisions like, how do I take these kids out? Yeah. You know, and you think putting a leash on your kid isn't a bad idea. No. <laughs> I used to think people are crazy to do that. Now, now I think, oh, hey, that's a really good idea. So. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So it's just uh, the challenges of uh, parenting and Having a two-earner family is very difficult to do and to pull off. But it's, it's, I, don't, I don't want to say it's for the best, but careers are important and raising the kids are important. And, but you, sometimes you sacrifice your personal life with your husband or your wife or whatever it's just because there's so much going on. It just becomes a difficult balancing act. So somehow you got to figure out a way to make it all work. Do you feel like that was a sacrifice that you ended up making? I think it's a sacrifice that many people make. Yes. That was like the most political answer I've ever heard in my life. Are you running for office? Never. <laughs> that, I'd rather watch your children full time. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You run for office. If you succeed, now you got to deal with everybody's problems. So when you think about, you've known, like you've had friends in your life who have gone into business for themselves and like you're kind of in business for yourself in your own retirement these days. And now one of your kids is in business for themselves. Why do people do that? Why do you do it? 
And what does it take if you want to be successful in business? It's something that's in your in you. Not everybody does it. It's just uh, you feel the uh, desire to succeed and to continue doing things. I mean, I'm old enough to be retired and just sit around in a rocking chair. But uh, who wants to do that? It's good to get up and do things. Uh, today, I was going to be painting. But you saved me from that. Now, tomorrow, when it's much warmer, it'll be a better day to paint. So you did me a favor. You're welcome. <laughs> But it's good just to have things to keep you busy. It's a satisfaction feeling, too, that you've either created something or done something or accomplished something. So, And plus, um, having worked for other people, uh, you don't get much satisfaction at the end of the day when you do stuff for other people. So sometimes if you do something for yourself that day, whether it might be painting a room or fixing your car, changing your oil, whatever it might be, you get satisfaction out of it. So always having a project going for yourself to do in my opinion, is a good thing it's just to keep me and many people going. Yeah. yeah. So the primary audience for this podcast, which is now called Seriously Connected, is women in business who are looking to start their own businesses or be successful in business. And I know that you're not a woman. And <laughs> so you're not like you can't like completely relate. But if you could share something like being like, I don't know, by osmosis, what would you share? Well, I can say this. I've worked for women, mm -hmm. and some of them are, and just like if they're women or men, excellent at what they do, excellent. And no problem working for them. Actually, I work harder for many of them. And if you're part of a team, you want the team to succeed. What I need now is a pencil and paper for everything I think of, even in the middle of the night when I wake up. I got to get up and write stuff down. So I say, hey, tomorrow morning, because I'm sitting here in the middle of the night and I can't sleep, let's write this down and I'll focus on it tomorrow because it's a good idea. But if I go back to sleep and I don't write this down, it's gone. Not that I have early Alzheimer's or anything, but it's just good to write stuff down and have a, uh, a list to work off. Check it off when you're done. I, I mean, if you're going to have your own business, you better have uh, lots of paper and pencil to write down all the things that need to be done every day or things you got to add to it and then cross off what you accomplish. And hopefully before you're done with your career, you've got a lot of stuff checked off. Well, can you share a little bit about what your career was? Uh, well, I retired from New York State Corrections. I was an officer, which is one job. Then I was a supervisor as a sergeant. Then a lieutenant, which does many other roles. You could be a watch commander. You could be doing hearings. You could be doing planning administrative work. It depends on what you uh, end up getting for a job in that. And then at the end of my career, I took a promotion into uh, the main office in Albany, and I worked as a captain doing security staffing. And that was nice, but um, I was the guy that walked into the facilities and said, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So although I was one of the people that was in there and did the job that they were doing, they still look at you like, you're here to help? Sure. <laughs> Sure you are. If you've done somebody else's job and you know how the job works and you are there, at least they know you've got a background and you're not just picked because you're somebody's friend or cousin or something and you needed a job. So I, I knew my job. So I was able to, you know, make things run better whether they liked it or not. Because <laughs> sometimes people don't like what you end up doing when you come to their place. But um, it actually made the place safer. Well, that has to feel good. Yeah. yeah. So. so the reason I, w I wanted you to share a little bit about what you did, well, it, I mean, a couple different reasons. To be completely clear, working for New York State Corrections means that you're in prisons. Correct. Like for how much of your life have you been in prison? Well, I, I did a little over 25 years. And uh, it's a young man's job. If you have an opportunity to get out, uh, I would advise you to get out <laughs> while you're young and go see what the world has out there for you to enjoy. What was it like being in prison? I mean, I know you weren't behind bars, but you kind of are. Yeah, well, it depends on what place you're working at, because I was in some very bad places and, and really great places. Let's go to the bad places. Why? Because it's more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the good places, when I worked at Mount McGregor, right up yeah. the road here, Okay. we used to take our work gangs and go to the state park mm -hmm. and clean it mm -hmm. and put together picnic tables and uh, clean up the bathrooms and places nobody else wanted to clean. And then we'd also clean up after the concerts. And when you did that, you had to really make sure you kept an eye on your inmates because they loved cleaning up after the concerts because there was stuff everywhere. 
<laughs> you mean like leftover alcohol? Alcohol or, you know, little... Joints? Yeah, little stubs of cigarette leftovers. Oh, they or would, that. Yeah. yeah, they would, uh, they would obviously, you know... Partake yeah, if they if could. they could, sure. So that was a, that was a, you know, that was like a, a job all the inmates wanted. Oh, we're going to clean up after the concert. Great. <laughs> so anyway... Um, those were good. And then on the other extreme, you know, you could be working in a special housing unit and you happen to wear a raincoat and a shield over your face as you walk up and down the tiers because the convicted people in there will do anything to uh, upset you, bother you, get your attention. So they could do something called defecation education. So if you got in the wrong place at the wrong time, they could be throwing something at you that was very disgusting. So you made sure that didn't happen because if that happened, your day was ruined. So fortunately in my career, I never had that happen to me, but I've seen it happen and I've seen worse than that happen with other bodily fluids thrown at people. Is this like a, a Hannibal Lecter, Silence of the Lamb situation? Uh, yep. Yeah. Something like that. So you okay. could, you could really, um, you know, and then, um, after that, you've got to uh, do something, right? You just can't allow that to happen. So how do you feel about confrontation? I don't like it. Nobody likes it. <laughs> I don't like it either. Yeah, yeah. So... But you, it sounds like you had to be confrontational even well, if you didn't want to be. I, I think um, here's, here's a good point to make. Okay. Once you're good at what you do, all the problems go away. One of the, one of the best things I could remember hearing is I was walking down a, a cell block at a place called Greenhaven, which is a, one of those bad places. I was a lieutenant there, and uh, an inmate stopped me in front of his cell gate and started complaining about what the other inmates were doing to him. And another inmate down the hall yelled out, don't waste your time with that lieutenant. He's a a-hole. The inmate that I was talking to just said, I'll go ahead. I don't, I don't want to talk to you about this then. So they knew that they were kind of wasting their time with their problems that were, you know, they, oh, I didn't get a, a roll of toilet paper today or some other, I don't want to call it insignificant thing, but something minor that is very easy to fix. And here I am, I'm, I'm supposed to, I'm actually running the whole place, but I got to make a supervisory round of everywhere. And uh, I got to stop and make sure this guy gets his toilet paper or some other thing that's insignificant. Or, or he, they took his toilet paper because he did something stupid with it, you know. And then he wants it back. Or some other really dumb, he took his sheet and made like a fishing line out of it and got a soda from somebody five cells down and got caught. So they took his sheet away. And now he's, you know, some, these are just the dumb things that happen that all of a sudden, and if, if you're the guy that did it, you're doing it for a reason. And now you could, you know, there's levels of this and you probably should go exactly by the rules and write somebody up, report for t tying up their sheet, but most of the times, because you're busy, you just grab it and throw it out and go on to the next thing, mm -hmm. you know, because there's something else brewing or whatever. So it becomes a complicated, I don't have any sheets anymore. And if an inmate shows up without any sheets, he's got to buy new ones. And that's his punishment for ripping a sheet up. Or Why would they write, rip their sheets up? The more you rip a sheet, just like you've probably seen in the movies, that they can climb down their sheet to get, get somewhere. They could make, they could take one sheet and make a hundred foot long string line out of it. But why? Where would they go? They throw it out their cell door and then they throw it to the next guy, the next guy, the next guy. Are they like share, like send things back and yeah. forth with the oh, sheet? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like what? What are they sharing? It could be... Notes? It could be a magazine. It could be uh, food, cigarettes, whatever, you know, whatever. So it was how they communicated with each other or gave each other things yeah, with yeah. sheets? Yeah. Or, or, you know, they would tie it off on a rope or something like that and just they called it fishing, and they would just fish back and forth. I, you could actually, funny, on the midnight shift, you could see lines going out windows, if your cells faced a window, going across a cell block, and then another person's line from another cell block going out their window, and they would connect them. And they'd be fishing back and forth from, you know, way over there, 100 yards to way over here, and they'd have it all figured out. They got good at it. Yeah, it sounds like you were kind of impressed. Well, it's amazing the things that come up yeah. while you're... Uh, you're walking along inside a prison in the middle of the night. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So. So you're saying the midnight shift, you don't sleep during the midnight oh, no, shift. You no, actually no. are working. No, there's, if you do, that, here's the, the other thing I can tell you that uh, makes sense. If you fall asleep, something's going to happen. That's why you don't do it because mm -hmm. they, the bad, I don't, bad, the people in there know 
If you're not doing your job, they're going to take advantage of you. That's why I said if you're good at what you do in any any job, the job gets better. So my hot take is that women are meant to be working with power tools and wood just all the time. Maybe not all the time, but I just feel like it might very much be a gift that women have that they don't even realize they have. And why am I saying this? Well, this morning I went to an event hosted by the Saratoga County Chamber of Commerce at the joinery, and it was all for women in business. And we were there to learn about, you know, network, work with other women in business, but also to learn about the joinery, this woodworking community space that is awesome. You can go there and make a chair. You can make a cheese board. You can make, what did she have? Like she had like a beer lunchbox that she was making, but out of wood. And it was so cool. And I had never seen so many women excited by power tools and the idea of finding exotic wood in a Curtis Lumber bin. The joy that women were getting on their faces while watching these amazing things be created out of wood by a former Saratoga Springs high school teacher named Ms. Terry was really cool. And I'm so glad that I went. And if you are somebody who is totally into this idea of creating things with your hands and working with wood, I'm going to include the link in the show notes because you should absolutely check out the Saratoga Joinery. Well, something you mentioned before we were talking about the ins and outs of being at Greenhaven, among other places, was that you found that you enjoyed working for some women in leadership roles rather than some men, some of the female bosses you had. Mm -hmm. And so I want to bring that up because we do have a you know female audience. What was it about working for women that you enjoyed? Just for any woman out there who's like, I don't think these guys are going to listen to me. Oh, no. I, I, uh, I don't want to say I could credit them. The, the, uh, you need everybody and you need every personality inside a place. And everybody has their pluses and minuses. Obviously, if you become a, a supervisor and then an upper level supervisor, you got there because you got, you got either good uh, common sense, street smarts, test taking skills, whatever it takes. You're, you become knowledgeable. You just, it just, you know, you've, you've done the work and you put the time in and you know what's going on. So they have solutions. Everybody has solutions to things and everybody sees it through their own way. And sometimes, you know, not that I want to put a woman here or a man there. We see, see things differently. And once you've been around a while, you, you, you want to take everybody's opinion and then do what you think is right. There's a lot of things that I've learned from women that I used in my career because it made the jobs go better. Man or woman, you just need good people around you and everything goes better. Like I said, uh, if you get good at your job, the job gets easier, much easier. And good women do good jobs and it made everything better. So if there's like three things a woman could do to like be the best boss, what what are those three things? Well, if you're going to be a boss, you got to have good leadership skills. So whatever it takes to gain them through either experience, watching other people, training classes, whatever it takes, you got to have good leadership skills. So uh, you better figure that out quick. <laughs> and so there's one. And then um, this probably falls under leadership, but uh, talking skills, calming people down, convincing them to do things a certain way, which is a better way. So your, your talking skills would be right in there with leadership skills. They would be the same thing probably. So That'd be good. And I would put this at the top of the list before anything. Get to work on time and stay late if you're needed. If you show up late, you better have a box of donuts with you <laughs> or something <laughs> like that because, you know, you, I'm going to need a bribe if you keep on showing up. Late. Get to work on time, good talking skills. There's three things. I'm going to stick with that. Okay. So. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. What was it like to have three kids while also working in prison? Prison was easier. <laughs> <laughs> what about like when, you, when your, your little girl was like, hey, dad, can you bring me to work with you on father daughter work day? Well, I think you've all had a, like a peak. You never get, brought me to work no, with you. I know Alyssa has. <gasps> yeah, Alyssa. 
jealousness uh, just fizzled through my body. Uh, Alyssa's, Alyssa's been to at least green a couple times. What? You brought her? I stopped to get my check or something, and she was with me, so I brought her in and showed her around a couple things. So. You never brought me. I desperately wanted to I didn't to want to bring anybody. I know. That's what you told me. I don't want to bring anybody. And right. you brought Alyssa. Yeah. Did you ever like get, make it to the parking lot or the lobbies or anything? No. no. Okay. Well, maybe the parking lot, but you didn't like bring me in. I didn't meet anybody. I met Jeff, and I met Ron Delaney. Oh, well. Some other like creeps. <laughs> there were some, there were some creeps that I met, but it wasn't ever like I didn't get to go inside the jail. Well, Alyssa has a couple of times. Well, and I think Ryan has too. At least at the, at least I <sighs> should have brought Ryan in. <laughs> <laughs> and now everything is making more sense. Thanks, Dad. Well, you're welcome. Appreciate it. Gosh, now I don't even know where to go. Where do you want to go? What do you want to talk about? Um, how about painting? <laughs> <laughs> I painted this room. You did? Yeah, I did. You did a good job. I had help. Okay. <laughs> do you wish you were painting still? No, not today. Okay. I, uh, it is cold. It's yeah. gross. Yeah. It's gross Plus, outside. I want it to be over 60 for the most part when I'm painting. Yeah. And I probably got a two days work outside and I'm done. You made a joke uh, not too long ago about Alzheimer's. Oh, so you think I can remember it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have noticed you making these jokes a lot lately, like just kind of backhanded or like, oh, I'm for sure getting it. Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, well, you know, I don't, put, don't put that out there. Okay. 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 You're still like warning me. It's just something to be cognizant to that. Uh, you know, these are, we all, um, yeah. Oh, here's here's one good thing I can say about that. Okay. The most important thing I've done is outlived my mother. That is true. Yeah. So. Why do you say it's the most important thing well, you've done? It's, it was almost a promise. What do you mean? Because my obviously my mom's children all passed away before her, except me, and it became a uh, I don't want to call it an obligation or a duty or whatever to make sure she had good care in her senior years, and to make sure she had the proper burial the way things were done in her generation. So I made sure all that happened. And that was a, whether I want to call it an obligation of duty or whatever, but it was just something that felt needed to be done for her, her way. So that's uh, sadly, uh, it stinks that a mom had to lose her children for whatever reasons. But um, that's why it became important for me to make sure I outlived her. So that was a big accomplishment for me. Not that I want to go anywhere. <laughs> Soon, but uh, that was important. I say I got to make sure I'm here for her. Yeah, so. you said it was the most important thing you've ever well, done. It was, when I look back at it, it becomes more important than other things. Like you know, um, your mom is your mom. You know, so maybe she's at one time the most important thing there is. She brought you into the world. She cared for you when you couldn't care for yourself. You know, so it's important that uh, you pay him back. Do you dream about her? Uh, I have, but it's rare. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever like feel like she's around? Well, I saw a cardinal today <laughs> and it was a nice red cardinal looking in the window at me. So every now and then, I don't know if that's a weird sign or whatever, but it makes you think of, uh, why is that cardinal looking at me? You know? <laughs> What's going on? So it makes you think of the uh, ones that have gone before us and just are checking on you or whatever, you know? So it's a, what do you want to call it, a God wink or something like that to where uh, you just feel like, hey, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. So Speaking of everything being okay, I, I was going to say sometimes I feel like I feel like grandma's with me. Usually like mm -hmm. right before I'm falling asleep at night, I like okay. sometimes think of her, but like it feels so realistic that I feel like she's there. And I'm like, why am I even thinking about this right now? Why does this feel so real, right? Like there's so many things I could be thinking about right now. Why is she infiltrating my mind? You know what? It's good. Yeah. It's good memories. So yeah, it is. When that happens, smile, take a deep breath and say, we got this grandma or whatever. <laughs> or mom. It's going to be okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, you kind of touched on this a little bit, the fact that you lost all your siblings. Have you gone? You ever went to therapy for any of that, or 
Do you want to talk about that? That's why I miss my motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I, you know, there's, I don't want to say there's nothing better, but I, I looked forward to getting on the bike and just taking a ride down the highway. You get a free feeling. It's happy. You know, you're kind of doing your thing. It's therapeutic. So that was my therapy in a way. So now I have a Maverick truck. <laughs> <laughs> not the same. <laughs> but life goes on, so yeah. yeah. So no, I've never really had social worker or counselor or anything, but I'm okay. Why are you okay? I don't know. <laughs> I just am. I don't know. Maybe I'm not okay and I don't even know it. <laughs> like I keep buying houses. <laughs> so can we talk a little bit about loss? Sure. Are you sure? Yeah. Um. So when did you first experience grief or loss? Oh, well, I was a teenager. My dad passed away. I was 14. So he was sick, and he, uh, he was a brittle diabetic all of his, not all of his life, but for at least the last, say, 15 years of his life. And uh, back in the 60s and 70s, I don't want to say they didn't have diabetes figured out, but they didn't have it figured out like they do now. And he, uh, you know, his, he would take his shot, but then he would think that he was an invincible and he could go eat and drink anything he wanted to, and he would go peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, and it just tore up his system. Sadly, he uh, had a couple of strokes. He had loss of uh, circulation and had to have some amputations on his fingers and toes, and uh, it just got worse and worse. He had to go into the hospital. His kidneys failed. Back in the 60s, a, a dialysis machine was probably bigger than this room, and it was a waiting line. So if you got to go on it once a week, you were lucky. Sadly, if your kidneys are failing, you, you need it more than that, as we know now. Like with Deb's dad, he had it four times a week, and the machine was the size of a, a mini fridge. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's come a long way, and it's a lot easier to do now. But back then, if you had kidney failure, it was fatal. You know, it was just a matter of, hey, they could help you a little bit now and then. But, um, you know, eventually you're sick all the time. And you're not, it's, I don't want to say it's better to pass away, but you're just kind of in this brittle condition where you just feel like crap. When did that start? How old were you when it first started? Oh, I was probably 11 or 12, and he died when I was 14. So yeah. he had three tough years at the end of his life. Do you remember the day he passed? Yeah, yeah. I remember the phone call. It he was, was at the hospital? He was at the Veterans Hospital in Albany, and they called my mom. She, we were at Marshall Avenue upstairs. I don't know if you can remember where the phone was upstairs. Was it in that? It was in a hallway on a little uh, shelving yeah. cabinet thing. Yeah, near the bathroom? Yeah, yeah. kind of like a linen cabinet. Yeah. And um, back then when the phone rang, you had to stand by it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I heard her talking to, I probably was a nurse or something, and uh, he had passed on, and the nurse was explaining it to her, and she started crying, and then I knew that it was bad. So, you know, I filled up, and then I went out and I hugged her and held her, and she said, uh, we got to go to the hospital. You know, we just worked through it. Sadly, uh, you know. So you were there when Grandma first found out that her husband passed away? Yeah. Were your other siblings? No. Where were you when she found out Tommy passed away? I was living at Marshall Avenue with her, but uh, I think she got the call downstairs, and I wasn't home, but when I got home, she was crying, so... I knew what had happened, and then, uh, you know, that was another, um, I had to figure out how to get the body back, make everything work, because he was in Oregon when it happened. And um, anyway, we worked it all out and uh, moved on. Uh, not that it's something you can move on from easy, but uh, we moved on. I just, like, so I'm your daughter. Yep. And it just, like, from my perspective, it seems like you were your mom's pillar her whole life. Every tragedy, you were the one who was there. You're correct. First on the scene. Yeah. Did you realize that? I was for all my siblings except for Patty. Yeah. But, yeah. What happened with Patty? Patty passed away at the hospital, and she got the call from her husband. Yeah, Uncle Wayne. Wayne. Yeah, and he uh, filled her in. But we knew that it was close. You know, you can kind of tell that uh, somebody's making a lot of mistakes as you get older. You start calling people by different names. Yeah. And uh, telling them stories about people that aren't even on the planet anymore, things like that. So you just go, yeah. okay, and you agree with them because what's the point in arguing with them, you know? So, yeah. So anyway. 
just kind of, I, I guess I thought that, um, aunt Patty was going to pass away before aunt Marion cause she was so much more sick. It looked mm-hmm. like yep. someday we'll talk about that, but we can't talk about that now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> was there a loss that was more painful than another? I, I, uh, they're all painful. So I wouldn't, I couldn't say that, uh, obviously, the closer someone is to you, the more you miss them and, and uh, the more it hurts, but they're all, they all hurt. So so I asked this because it kind of felt like it just kept happening, right? Mm-hmm. Like one after another, after another, yep. <laughs> after yep. another. And, and for me, I was, what, 13 the first time? When, when Aunt Marion passed away, I was in sixth grade. I think this was 90, I was, 98. I was 12, 11. For me, that one was really painful. Aunt Patty was painful, but I felt it a little bit less. And then Grandma T, I went numb. Like I stopped feeling. And I just felt anger and then I felt nothing. And then I kind of felt nothing for a long time. And I think I felt nothing because it was so much coming and I got, I got to see the grief that my parents were going through, and I just wanted to make them feel better because I loved them so much. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just decided to stop feeling. That's, it's difficult when you, you know, you could be at a funeral or some other mass or something, and uh, when you see someone else tear up, it has a bigger effect on you then than it does if it didn't happen. You kind of... You lose your emotions because you see somebody else's emotions being lost. So you kind of lose them all together. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So you never went numb. No. You I, always I felt all of the numb. pain. I I don't want to call it pain. It's sadness. You know. So is sadness pain. It's a form of pain, I guess. But time heals, and it takes a <laughs> lot of time. So you you just get through it. The uh, yeah. hopefully no more events happen, and you get a little bit better every day. Or a little bit less sad. I always wondered to myself, like, how grandma was able to be, like, such a joyful person, right? Like, she was, like, the happiest lady I knew. Right. And she always, like, brought happiness and light to, like, every room. She was so silly. Um, I'm pretty sure she flirted with my husband every chance she got. It just happened. I Anyway, I'm going to stop. Because remember that <laughs> there was a time she... she she found a Victoria's Secrets magazine. <laughs> Do you know this story? No, I don't. Oh, well, let's talk about it with Steve sometime. <laughs> um, but um, but I just, uh, well, the reason, I, I think for such a long time, I, ha- I had a hard time understanding how could someone who experienced so much loss be so joyful. Okay. No, I get it. Um, yeah. But I think the answer is that's the only way she could survive. Yeah. Yeah. And she prayed every day, too. So I, you got to give her that somehow. She had good faith. Yeah. So that helps. Okay. So this week's serious business lesson is more mental health related than maybe you were expecting, maybe more than I was expecting. If you're anything like me as an entrepreneur, you are really interested in solving problems. You're almost compelled by solving problems. You are a problem solver. If you're a business woman and an entrepreneur, you're likely a problem solver. And I had this like nauseous pit in my stomach feeling all last week. And I couldn't put my finger on why I felt so uncomfortable. It was driving me kind of insane. And then I went to therapy because you know, with all that that's what we're talking about in this episode. I, I do. I go to therapy regularly and I just think mental health is important. And I was expressing to my therapist what was going on with me. And she was like, it sounds like everything's just going well. She's like, it sounds like things are going good. It sounds like there's no problem for you to solve right now. So how do you just sit in that? And I was like, well, I guess I don't sit in it well because I've been feeling nauseous all week. Um, And and I think that it's just so interesting that if the thing that has helped you to build your business, to grow your business is this need to solve problems, what do you do when things are working out? What if once the seeds that you planted started to grow and things are growing well, what do you do next? search for more problems to solve. (laughs) 
I guess, is, is what my go-to is. And now that you've met my dad, you know that we can't like feel good for too long without feeling like the floor is going to fall out from underneath us. But something that we did together in that session was write down some positive things that were going for my business. So next time I were to feel uncomfortable in it, just to remind myself what those positive things were. So anyway, these are now things that I can say to myself anytime I feel uncomfortable and it is helping me. And if you do something similar to this, please let me know and share with me what you're doing to help yourself feel comfortable and safe in your own success until a new problem arises. So something I've been working on in therapy so fun, is talking about, you know, the the ways in which we show up in the world. And something that we've kind of identified is that maybe one of the reasons I was such a good journalist, um, showing up on the worst day of someone's life, like over and over and over again, and connecting with those individuals, Mm -hmm. and then doing interviews with them on camera to be on the news that very same day, which feels exploitative and wrong. Like as I'm saying it, it feels exploitative and wrong, but I was really good at it. And I did it day in and day, like every day for a long time. And I think that for me, I was repeating patterns because I felt so comfortable being there for you on the worst days of your life or being there her mom in the worst days of her life. And I just started repeating those patterns because I was so good at falling into that role. Well, you never know what you're going to be good at in this world, huh? (laughs) Who knew? (laughs) Well, I don't want to say that stinks, but uh, maybe you're a good grief therapist someday. Who knows? I don't know if I'm a good grief therapist, but I just think that I am... can I can I it's easy for me to empathize with people to like slip into the spaces of like extreme sadness and torment and pain it does feel like pain to me because it hurts my like insides doesn't hurt your insides you know I people feel grief differently I would say it does but I, I only have when that happens and it does happen it's rare and it doesn't last long but it has happened and usually uh You know, that's when a guy probably wants to go punch something or hit something or break something. Put your head in a refrigerator. Yeah, things like that. So you just have to, those are rare and they they come and they go fast and then they're over. Yeah. So we all have those uh, moments, but. I read a study that every emotion, like when you're like triggered or you're feeling an emotion, it lasts 90 seconds. So if you can bear it for 90 seconds, (laughs) (laughs) bear it. For those 90 seconds. And once you're through it, it will, you will have felt it. Yeah. Because holding back feeling emotions can do more damage to your. Or you could, here's a good example. Yeah. You could have a life situation that you're sad about, mm-hmm. and then something else happens. Like um, maybe uh, the kid runs in front of your car, and you're already sad. You don't hit the kid, but you put the brakes on and just miss them. And you get out of the car and you just scream at him like crazy because you're already upset over your own problems. And this kid has no idea why you're screaming at him. He just goes, thanks for not hitting me. And uh, you light into the kid because you've got all these pent-up stress and emotion in you and you're taking it out somewhere where you shouldn't. But it happens. Did you do this to one of my kids? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a neighbor kid. <laughs> no, no. no I, I just mean I'm just using that as an example. But yeah. we, all, we all carry around a, our own... Uh, emotions and feelings and grief and sometimes we uh take it out on the wrong people at the wrong times just because they happen to be there so has it changed how you show up in the world i don't show up in the world anymore the world comes to me (laughs) (laughs) so i would say the ways in which you show up in the world now compared to growing up with you is quite different yeah yeah we now you feed dogs at the table Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) Better food than I fed my kids. Thanks for that. But growing up, you would not feed a dog from the table. No, no. the dog had to go in his uh, crate. Yeah. Anytime we ate. Yeah. So, yeah. So, like, do you think that that is maybe perspective on life? Do you think it's thanks to your lovely wife? I would definitely attribute that to my lovely wife because that's something that she's okay with and it became okay with me too because 
what's the big deal? You know, people are happy. It's not hurting anybody. I'm, it's not, a, we're not at a point in our lives where we're no longer like uh, educating or training or helping a younger person grow up. So we're, we're okay. You're helping my kids. Yeah. That's yeah. helpful. Well, that's different. When the, well, when the kids are there, they're going to see things. Maybe grandparents do things different than mom and dad do. So, How much more TV do they get with you? It all depends. <laughs> I don't want to say a lot, but they get it. I know. But uh, <laughs> they don't get a lot more. But, uh, and plus that is also, you know, we all have to have our little bargaining chip. So if you want to watch that television, you're going to have to eat all your supper or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever else the, uh, it's a carrot. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so do you use a carrot more now than a stick? All the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. also, you know, if for my own personal mental health, if the kids bugging me and bugging me and bugging me and bugging me and driving me nuts, here, take the remote. <laughs> So they know. <laughs> Go in there and watch something and leave me alone. So it yeah. all depends on what we're up to. But uh, I understand we're going to be seeing them, a little bit more of them, either this weekend or next weekend. Next weekend. So we're going to come up with some crafty things to do. Yay. So we're going to keep them busy. And uh, we've already, Deb and I have already kind of put a couple of like Halloween-ish plans together. Nice. And maybe some uh, Christmas presents are going to be made. Oh, that's really nice. I really like yeah. that Debbie does that with yeah. them. So, yeah. If you could talk to, I don't know, 13 year old Greg now, what would you say to him? Well, uh, knowledge is power. So get the best education you can get would probably be where I wish I went further with. But, yeah. uh, but that's, that's it. I mean, I was a pretty energetic young man. So I mean about all of the loss that you experienced. What would you say to Reggie? Is that too hard of a question? Suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> Suck it up, Buttercup. <laughs> you, you know these. Because you weren't expecting uh, it. No, you know, there's a lot of things that are going to hit you out of the blue in your life, and when it happens, it happens. You can't. You just never know. That's why I think I've told you this before. When you think everything's going good, watch out, because you just don't know what's around the corner. You know. And some days you just do this series of great, great, great things happen, and all of a sudden, holy crap, where did that come from? So you just never know. So enjoy it. When it's good, it's good. But you just, you know, you never know what's around the corner. Did you ever feel like you experienced enough grief that you would be safe from future grief? No. No. As long as you love something, you can lose it. Whether it's another person, an animal, uh, whatever it might be, you know, a lifestyle, whatever it could be. Everything is uh, capable of being taken away. In a, look at these poor people with that hurricane, you know. You just you just never know what's around the corner. They're up in the mountains in North Carolina. How the hell is a hurricane ever going to go up there, you know, and they got wiped out? Yeah. How do you expect that? So you just never know what's going to happen, you know. So you got to make the best out of the days you got and and enjoy what you have and, Look after those little ones because they're going to grow up before you know it. They yeah. probably already are on you. It's crazy. Yep. yep. I guess what's next for you? Like, what are you looking forward to in your life? Pork chops. <laughs> you just going day to day, Dad? <laughs> like... We just put an offer on a house. Mm-hmm. Uh, the house needs a lot of updating and maintenance. So that's going to keep me busy for a while. So I got that to look forward to. Um, we're going to transition out of one pretty nice house into another nice house, which also has a built-in pool, which will become a, uh, I'm trying to make that Deb's job instead of mine. Well, I just am wondering, the last time you had a pool in a house that you owned, I'm pretty sure you took an axe to it. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. But that wasn't above ground. This is an in-ground. Ah. <laughs> and uh, it, um, it's just a nice setup. Yeah. If you, you you've only seen pictures, but uh, yeah. Once someday when you're there, you'll say, "Hey, this isn't bad. There's this little gazebo out there." A place it it, it is. It looks the backyard looks amazing. Yeah. I so, feel like the kids will really like yeah. coming over. Yep, yeah. that's another plan. We're going to build a little sky fort back there for them. Aw, that'll be great. Yeah. So there'll be a swing set back there, and there'll be um, mm-hmm. something for them to do while they're there instead of trying to get into the pool. <laughs> yes. And also, um, there could be new grandkids coming at some point. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You never uh, know. Not from me. Just 
well, in general. Yeah. We got other options out there that <laughs> yeah. don't include you, which is fine. That's great. <laughs> Do you um, ever miss jail? <laughs> no, no, that is not a fun job. As the job paid the bills and it had good health insurance. The time off was terrible, if you can remember. I remember. And, um, you know, the, uh, but right now I have a pension, which is very helpful. So mm-hmm. there's something good came out of that. So thank goodness. Yeah. So would you share any stories about me? As a child, uh, well, anything journalistic that caused you stress? I, I, just one funny thing that probably ties into your journalistic life. Getting a book out of your hands at night so you would go to sleep. <laughs> this girl would read books all night long, wouldn't put them down. I'd go in to check on her while when I'm going to bed, and she'd be under the covers with a flashlight reading. Yeah. And how many... You know what it takes to get a kid to read a book nowadays? And this girl just wanted to read and read and read. So you were an exception in that category. Yeah. So that's kind of different. (laughs) Thanks, Dad. (laughs) I was going to say, I was a shy kid growing up, right? Yeah, yeah. Are you surprised that I went into TV news? Not. It was, you know, you were going to be a marine biologist, so you chose to go in that direction. Yeah, I did a report that showed me that marine biologists don't make a lot of money. So I was like, cool, TV (laughs) also don't make a lot of money. What was I thinking? One time, Dad, I was on a story and this guy came up to me and he was not wearing a shirt and he was like big and sweaty and angry and like hostile. This was in Augusta, Georgia. And he was like, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And I was like, I'm just so sorry. I don't know. They sent me here and I'm supposed to film something, but I don't even know where it is. And I just like, this camera is so heavy and I can't even get the tripod out of the car. I don't know where to put it. Like, I don't, I I, I don't know. And he was like, oh, well, I can help you. And I was like, could you? Help me. Nice man. (laughs) Your smarts got you out of that. I I don't know where that came from, but that was the first time I knew to not come at escalation with like, I was like, de-escalate, de-escalate, de-escalate. You avoided conflict. Yeah. I don't know where that came from, though. It was just like, I know that I won't win this fight. I will not win. So... How do I survive? <laughs> that was pretty much it. I don't know if I learned that from you or from somewhere else, well, but it was in my books. It could be, yeah. Could be my books. I think so, uh, something I learned really quick is if someone was coming at me with anger, frustration, attitude, was to cater to their will. Hmm. If I'm in your hometown with a camera and a tripod, I'm sorry. How can I help you? I'm weak and sad and insignificant in your world. But maybe you could help me. (laughs) Maybe you could be my hero. (laughs) That's a good angle to go with as long as uh, you don't, you know. Will you share the Harriet the Spy story? No. Why? I don't remember it. Okay, I remember it. So when I was little, I totally connected with Harriet the Spy, yep. right? Because yep. like she was a weirdo who like spied on her neighbors and wrote about it in her book. And I felt, you know, like the same kind of person. And so I made a little book that was on a cosmopolitan notebook and I wrote private on it just like hers. And then I started sp- spying on our neighbors and writing about it in our book. And then you got a call from our neighbors because they were about to call 911 on me. And you had to, like, talk to the police or something. You don't remember this story? It was at Quivic Drive. It's nothing? No. There's nothing there? Not for that, no. Can't, can't. Sorry, Harriet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I barely remember the book. Yeah. Yep. But yeah. I do remember you having it, so. Okay. Okay. I thought you would remember that story. Damn. Sorry. Who else would remember it? It's lost. Maybe the people that you wrote about will remember it someday. When I you wonder if I can up. find that diary. <laughs> it might be in my basement. I might be moving it soon. <laughs> Isn't so, that how it goes? If I find it, I'll let you know. All right. <laughs> how would you describe me? Well, the bookworm was good. I mean, that's different. So that you're, that's a, I don't know if that's a, uh, 
something you're different than other people, but maybe it goes along the lines as knowledge is power. The more you put in your brain helps you in your future. Maybe that's how you learned how to de-escalate that situation that you mentioned, just because you either read something about it or thought that was a, a good angle to use at that time. So how can I describe you as that? That's just the first thing that comes to mind. But you're a pretty well-rounded person. And I think you've got enough knowledge to do almost anything. That's probably why you own a small business. Not a lot of people want to do that. <laughs> true. True story. Yeah. So. I just, are, like, I feel like I wasn't made for this. But did you, do you see that? I feel like I'm, like, growing into it. But I don't feel like I was meant, like, I wasn't. Well, well did you. I feel like I was you, too you, sensitive you, of a kid to be, a like, a owner of a business. Hmm. But I also feel like it's because I was so sensitive that I'm an owner of a business. Yeah, well, you never know. Uh, similar with me, I, I was never a good public speaker. But in my career, I used to have to hold a lineup every day and speak to 150 people every day sometimes and tell them what's going on and how they should conduct themselves because of what's going on. So you just, you, you uh, as you get into a situation, you, you realize that's a responsibility and you want to do a good job. So you... You prepare for it and do the best you can. And sometimes uh, you get rewarded for it. Um, if you could, you know, say something to your kids, what would you say to them? Alyssa, Ryan, Christine. Look after each other. Make sure you got each other's backs. Live your lives with, uh, with happiness, but don't forget to reach out to each other from time to time and make sure everybody's well. Because before you know it, you're going to be my age. And you're going to go, where the hell did the time go? I didn't get to do this or that yet. So let's go do it. And now you got to go do it. So don't forget to go do those things. I talk to Alyssa almost every day. Well, that's good. That's yeah. good. Any advice out there for women uh, in business? I think uh, get to work on time and uh, be a good listener and, and um, be a leader. Awesome. There you go. Thank you, Dad, for going outside your comfort zone and being interviewed by me today. You're welcome appreciate it and i love you thanks for being my dad you're welcome <laughs> okay cut get out of here <laughs> thank you guys so much for listening to seriously connected this week i am your host for this month of the show, my name is Christine O'Donnell and my business is Bright Sighted Media. For more information on that, you can find it on my website, brightsighted.com. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you next week.